Do you, here's the thing. We talk a lot about anxiety, but I was yeah. wondering if you've ever, if we've ever had any reason uh, to talk about d- depression. <laughs> We've we've that tripped was the light not depression a laugh line. No, I don't that know. was weird. I don't know why that was a laugh line for me. Uh, do you consider yourself a depressive uh, personality at all? No, I mean I, everyone has dumps, and sometimes you're down in them. But I would not consider myself. I would consider myself anxious over depressed. Okay, very much so. Would you call yourself a realist? What does that mean? I that's one of those words that I don't know. I, I think I know what that means, but I've never stopped to think about it. A realist is someone um, like a pragmatist. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. Someone who has a sense of uh, like that is grounded in their experience of reality. Just to a point, because I have to bring I'm going def- to give you a definition. Oh, a person who it. accepts a situation as it is and is prepared to deal with it accordingly. A person who believes that the subject matter of politics is political power, not matters of principle. An artist or writer whose style is characterized by the representation of people or things as they actually are. I'm only able to I would like to say mostly I'm a realist, but I can't give myself full credit because my anxious flights of fancy, I will fill in voids with conversations mm-hmm. that people are having about mm-hmm. me that I have no idea if they're having. That are or, fantastical. Which are right. fantastical, right. exactly, yeah. And so yeah. I can't, I would like to think that I'm a realist. I'm a definitely a realist about certain things, but also I fill in the gaps. Okay. Uh, do you, do you, have you ever heard of the term depressive realism? <laughs> no, but I am intrigued. Depressive realism, ooh. It is, gonna hurt. it is a thing, and okay. it has been a thing for a long time. The thesis is, by as originally developed by Lauren Alloy and Lynn Yvonne Abramson, that. that depressed individuals make more realistic inferences than non-depressed individuals, right? So if you are depressed, you are a more realistic person. <laughs> Interesting. Wait, because why? Why, what, what is the correlation between those? That's interesting. Well, they did a study, and it was a study that essentially asked people to uh, to push a button and a button that would turn on a light. And sometimes the light would turn on and sometimes it wouldn't. And uh, according to their research, the people who pushed the button and the light and, and, and you know waited for the light to go on had a more realistic bias to the control over which they had on the button. So after a while, the theory, as the, their research went, they would push the button, the light wouldn't go on, and they would say in their depressive, realistic persona, I don't have any control over that button. Right? Uh, like, yes. I, I am realistically experiencing the world, and when I push the button, I don't have any control. So that was their thesis. Yeah. This catches us up to today uh, <laughs> as we are talking. Yeah. Uh, it turns out that that is complete bunk. Really? This study has just been reproduced. They were just trying to find, because this study has been widely touted as truth and fact and justice. That in fact, oh, I'm not depressed. I'm a depressive realist, which means I see the world more clearly than, you know, you because you don't live with depression. And it turns out, it turns out that is just not true. Uh, It has been cited more than 2,000 times in later studies and research. It is infused into science, culture, and potential mental health treatment policy. And this new author, study uh, co-author Dan Moore, is a chair of leadership and communication at the University of California, Berkeley, says uh, this, this widespread acceptance of this existent study meant we had to question it. We had to actually see if we could reproduce the results, and we couldn't. Right. In fact, what we found was, yes, people who live with with clinical depression were able to see that they did not have control over the button. And also, they were depressed about everything that they did have control over, too. They were universally <laughs> depressed. It didn't make them any more likely. It didn't make them any more likely to, to see the, tr- they the, were just... the truth. It made them more likely to not believe they had control over anything, even stuff they had control over. Because I was wondering where, the, where it crosses over into just straight up pessimism. Yes. Yeah. And that sounds yes, like that's this. it. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty much what they that's pretty much what they found. And uh it was a an incredibly wow. good day for science. And uh, you know, as it is with every day, if you're depressed, 
uh, yet another lousy day right. for depression. <laughs> you know who also it's a good day for? Textbook publishers. Hmm. Cha-ching! <laughs> <laughs> Rewrites! <laughs> Welcome to What's That Smell, a sometimes funny podcast about humans and their anxieties. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Tommy Metz III. And each and every week we drag one of our deepest, darkest anxieties into the light to share it, learn about it. And hopefully laugh about it with all of you. Reach out. Send us the story of your anxieties. Just visit whatsatsmell.net. There's a button in a row across the top. It just says submit your anxiety. And if you press that button, you're taken to a form where you can put your name and your email address, but only if you want to, and your anxiety. And then you press submit and it'll come to us just like the person who sent their anxiety today and then we'll talk about it laugh about it and love it but not at you <laughs> with you and with that you'll go first oh pete i am as surprised as you are that we haven't talked about this yet <gasps> and you don't even know what it is yet so that <laughs> sentence should have come later anyways we're going ahead we're forging ahead pete for this harrowing tale i would like to take you to the white mountains of new hampshire back in 1961 here's a question wow. have you heard of betty and barney hill Oh, you mean from season three, episode four? <laughs> nope, we have not brought them up Kidding. before. <laughs> Joke. That was a gab. Even Appreciate. if you feel like you haven't heard of Betty and Barney Hill, and this goes for the listeners too, in a way, you definitely have. In September of 1961, the married couple were driving in a mostly empty country road. They noticed a strange bright light seemingly following them along the road. They worried they were being chased. Well, hell, why don't I let them tell you? A little bit. In recorded interviews, they share the tale. When we, traveling south on Route 3, arrived in an area called Lancaster, New Hampshire, Betty called my attention to uh, an object or a star that she had been watching. As I was watching, this star seemed to be getting larger and brighter. Mm -hmm. And we, as we rode along, I kept watching it, and then all of a sudden, I noticed that it had started to move. And we decided to stop, get out of the couch, and take a look at it. I told her that it was probably a satellite. Nothing to get alarmed about. Flash forward, they both arrive at their home in Portsmouth at dawn, but they can't fully remember how they got there. Their clothes are dirty and ripped, both of their watches have stopped, and they realize that they lost time over two hours that neither of them could remember. They were so concerned by this, they went and saw a psychiatrist separately, who then used hypnosis to recover their memories. What was eventually uncovered was that the hills had been led by, quote, gray beings with large eyes into a wide metallic circle, end quote. Once inside, the beings examined the couple and erased their memories. Pete, we've all heard of abduction stories, but Betty and Barney Hill in 1961, this is the first one that got really famous wow. and became nationwide news. And as a result, it defined the basic framework of abductions. Gray beings, large black eyes, humanoid shape, cylindrical ship, weird medical examinations. Because this story receives so much fanfare, even though, as a side note, the couple wanted it kept under wraps because they were in an interracial relationship at a time when it wasn't that cool to be in one. Anyways, it became the archetype with many similar stories following. Now, Pete, this is a long-winded way to get into my anxiety for this week, and I'm bringing it up because there seems to be such a ramp-up in information about the topic. Pete, finally, in season seven, I would like to talk about <laughs> xenophobia! <laughs> the fear of aliens, with Greek xenos meaning foreigners, and phobos the god of yikes. Of course, xenophobia can also be a fear of people from a foreign country, but this would be a very different <laughs> podcast if I went that route. So let's stick to E.T. So before I turn it over to you, I want to say why am I bringing this up now? In case you haven't been watching, uh, listener, <laughs> singular, <laughs> partly because the government is finally talking about it, largely in the case of what we used to call UFOs, less about abductions and more UFOs. Now we call UAPs. Pete, you're a smarty. Do you know what UAP stands for? The Unidentified Air Patrol. 
Very <laughs> close. <laughs> Very close. And if it makes you feel any better, I misspelled all three words as I'm looking at my notes. Uh, it's unidentified aerial phenomenon. I believe one of the reasons they changed it is they're starting to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. And the word UFO has sort of become it was a laugh taken. out loud for yeah. people. In 2021, the Department of Defense issued a report detailing more than 100 sightings that it was investigating. And in the Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal year 2023, this is things that are just happening right now. Did you read about this? This is a budget that governs uh, like America's like sexy clandestine stuff that we probably would start an absolute revolution if we found out about it. Um, Congress made two incredibly startling claims, and it's like buried in the copy. Um, number one, it said the first is that, quote, cross domain transmedium threats to the United States national security are expanding exponentially, end quote. Uh, a cross domain transmedium threat is pretty much defined as like something that can move from water to air to space in ways that none of us it's understand. Like a triathlete. So they're saying, yeah, <laughs> exactly. They can fish and hunt <laughs> and like do a pole vault. Um, so number one, they're saying this stuff that we don't understand is a lot more is coming and it's developing exponentially. And then number two, it wants to distinguish between UFOs that are human in origin and those that are not saying, quote, temporary non-attributed objects, ugh, government, or those that are positively identified as man-made after analysis will be passed to appropriate offices. So they're saying, we don't get what they are. They're not all human. And we're really taking a look. Oh, and they're coming for us. <laughs> it's a huge statement by Congress who has usually denied all of this stuff. In July, the Pentagon, the Pentagon, the Pentagon, what, what do you what do you wear when you're doing secret stuff? A Pentagon, a Pentagon. <laughs> don't don't leave that in. Cut that out. The whole thing is staying. In July, the Pentagon announced that it was opening the AARO, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, to investigate these threats. And they just started their nine month study on Monday, October 24th this year. And we're expected to have a public study in mid-2023. Stuff's getting real, Pete. I'm about to ask you a question, but I'm still talking. Before <laughs> I ask your overall thoughts, I haven't been this ramped up since ants. You I really like, are. I would like to clarify, I'm not personally nervous that I'm going to be abducted by aliens who want to get their probe on. But I am worried about what might happen if we do make contact with alien life and what that might mean for the world as a whole. Certain nations, I'm looking at you, America, seem incapable of holding general peaceful elections. We can't find, figure out supply lines. How are we going to cope with extraterrestrial contact? Now, as I take a deep breath, uh -huh. Pete, do you believe, do you think they will? And does it give you any shivers or are you potentially, my guess is, you're completely psyched about it. <laughs> I kind of think, I kind of see what you is, as someone that it's not a, it's not an insult at all, but you might be like, no, don't be scared of things. It's going to be great. And of course there are and all of that stuff. Because I don't know. I have that feeling about you because you, you and I agree that space is a hellscape, but also you find infinite potential in space where I <laughs> never want to go there ever. No, thank you. Well, oh, look, Fox Mulder, I yeah. think that uh, I'm of I'm of multiple minds on okay. on this thing. Fun. First of all, I am increasingly uncomfortable with claims like Congress has because has Congress really or has it been Marjorie Taylor Greene? You know what I mean? Like like what part of 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 what people in Congress are influencing the most like uh, sure. crazy parts of it right i just say like there's some crazy stuff going on in the house and in the senate yes. and i just feel like who's a part of it really now i also happen to be someone who believes that you mean is, who's a part of the study that's going to be happening yeah, no, or the, who's a part like of talking about it all of the stuff things. and all of it. it like i i totally get that like but what got it you know cross medium triathlete aliens is is one of those <laughs> things that i just i but so first and foremost Yes, yeah. you're right. I am psyched about it. The fact that I believe <laughs> to my core that there is that just the maths alone indicate right. we cannot be alone in the, the infinite principle. space of right. galaxies and universes and foreverness. Right. We just there has got to be something else. Uh, and so that that part, I just I, I believe. Is this how they want to be found out, like between really? 
crazy like fringe elements of the American like like what what uh, why do I ever hear all these stories from you know Italy? <laughs> they have all sorts of other stuff they're dealing with. Why do we ever hear this stuff from like you know what I mean? Like it just feels like we have a corner on the crackpot mar- market, and I so see. I. I worry a little bit about jumping too quickly onto my own innate enthusiasm bandwagon because the U.S. government has put money towards something that is that I think is still just a touch sketchy for my for my comfort. Are you saying so you're saying that the the possibilities of us making contact are still extreme just because we're looking right at it. It's still extremely yeah. low. Right. That's I agree what with I, that. That's kind and of And that's what, what a lot so, of the science says too. They're not, yeah. while we are building Galileo projects, trying to have mm-hmm. like the first high resolution picture of a UFO. There are people that are really searching out there, but yeah. a lot of what we're talking about is we don't understand this YouTube clip. Let's figure it out. That's kind of where I am. And, and I also, yeah. I really want to be clear. Like I, I'm not a daily student of this stuff. Like I don't follow <gasps> Pete. most That's of the fine. stuff that you're talking about, right? Like yeah. I don't follow the <laughs> all the time. <laughs> I'm not a daily reader of the <laughs> right. 2023 budget allocation. Um, but I but I am really curious as more and more information is released, like what do we know? I think that is something that legitimately should be more public. I would like to know more about what we know as a, a populist and what has been vetted by the scientific community as, you know, something we can believe in. That's supposed to be what this new paper is going to do. Now, they might Congress it up. I mean, you know, that's the biggest when they have such a catchy name as the <laughs> AARO, the ARU, uh, you know, we might not have the best. But, and I am, I do join you in the temporary non-attributed objects and cross-domain transmedium threats. Yeah. There's also a chance that they're going to jargon us to death, to death. on purpose. What, right. what is your general, like when you hear about all this stuff, is it, this gives you the, a sense of existential dread? Like you don't want to meet our galactic neighbors? I... Truck and Sounds like even trans, and love, trans-dimensional neighbors, even. Sci- and sci-fi and stuff is always, I and throughout this podcast, I lean towards just because we can doesn't mean we should. Yeah. Because the huge amount of, yes, absolute fiction that I've read has mm-hmm. told me, don't put your finger in there and keep your head down. <laughs> like, that's pretty much what every single movie and book that I've read that involves space has been. Mm-hmm. That the, um, I mean, from old jokes from, like, To Serve Man to everything, like old Twilight Zone episodes. I am worried, when you said existential, that's a good way to say it, because I my worry, I have two worries. One is very, very real world, realist, and the other is more, I think, existential. The existential one is, I don't believe that we will know how to handle it actually yeah. maybe it's both the real the realist and the there's a st- there's another study oh i love studies that was just released this year that really gets to the heart of my realism part i my problem with thinking about alien life is in all movies and stuff it's still generally pretty humanoid except for things like the arrival mm-hmm. we're always sort of assuming that the head's on the top and that we can communicate and things. There's very little hard sci I mean, there's very little soft sci-fi that actually takes place in that they could be here already. We just yeah. don't know how to look at it. And the fact of that we won't know how to do anything and handle it. Here, let me get in. Can I get into the study real quick? God, I it's not it. It, it's not a ton, I promise. It's not the huge avalanche that I did before. But a new study was published this year by researchers from Penn State and NASA. And in it, they pretty much say, and I'm very much paraphrasing, that the dangers of aliens, if we make alien contact, let's say they show up and they're like, hey, beep boop, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. That the real danger won't come from the aliens themselves. It'll come from us, humans and nations trying to work with it. They outline a scenario where a certain nation or nations try to gain what they call a communication and information monopoly with the extraterrestrials. America gets there first, and we want to be the only ones that they talk to and trade with. And this could, of course, lead, will lead to international conflict with other nations fearing that we're gaining alien technology to subjugate them. And unfortunately, that sounds incredibly plausible to me. (laughs) 
Yeah. I mean, just the history of new people coming and then what we do with that, whether we're the new people, which is a disaster, or new people come to us, which is a disaster. Um that could be a real problem. And then they also warn in the paper that the technology or stuff would most likely be way beyond our understanding or ability to harness. The authors compare it, I wrote a quote, a quote, to medieval scholars being handed a textbook on nuclear weapon design, which would be useless in the absence of understanding of nuclear physics, end quote. If they're able to get to us and communicate with us, we've been left behind. <laughs> we've been in the sandbox yeah, yeah, for too that's long. That's really it. And it it, I mean, they're probably, as you said, they're probably already here and they're probably just waiting for us to figure out how to get along with each other because they don't want us to blow each other up and them. That's the that's the bottom line. They're just smarter than we are. I I am still an optimist it, at heart. Like, I believe it or not, I am not a depressed and realist. I am an optimist at heart. And I have I have uh, uh, like I believe in humanity being able to fix its woes. Yes. Now is not a great time right. to, to be thinking too much about out there when really, you know, we have a lot to do like in our backyard. We need to fix the water problem in Flint, Michigan, which is still going on. We need to fix like we just need right. to fix how we talk to each other. And so I think the my existential crisis would be, oh Why my now? God, <laughs> we're so distracted by this, the budgetary allocation for extraterrestrial research for UAP research and and fact finding that we've forgotten there are things right now that we can we have the capability the technology if we only had the will and the clarity we could fix them so that would be my fear that we that we get distracted by stuff that isn't like that that is just too big now on the other side right. of that my I love, my like I love all of that yeah techno my technophilia is Maybe yeah. they give us cool stuff. Like maybe they maybe they are sexy Star Trek aliens and they come down with like blue pew pew energy beams and <laughs> kind of stuff where we can see through walls and stuff. That'd be cool. I'd take all of that. I want to teleport places. What so, if they just go to Flint and bring like Dasani? <laughs> they just bring bottled <laughs> Sorry, water and we're like, we thanks. <laughs> but we have a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> like that's, that's really, thanks. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're good, alien. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I don't. I think that's. I think what you bring up, like anytime we talk about aliens, my I do have like my anxiety gets on edge, like the little mm. hairs stick on the back of my neck. But it's not because I'm necessarily afraid of aliens or have anxiety about you know aliens replacing cultural icons or whatever. Like I oh, feel right. I am anxious because I don't believe we can. I don't believe I we don't. can handle it. Right. I think you As and I are species. on the same. Yeah. yeah. How do well, we get dark. there? Yeesh. How do we get there then? How do we figure it out? Well, I I think more people need to repudiate Dasani, for one. Okay, so we take There's down no Dasani. No way that take it first. Step one, fight aliens. Okay. Stop number Dasani's. One. <laughs> number influence. one. No more Dasani. Number two, elective probing. Yeah. We just get all. <laughs> How to be elective. That's important. Yeah, we, we really lean into it. <laughs> At least we know what we're going to get. You got to be yep. prepared. Be pre That's right. Because the problem is just the anticipation. Yeah. <laughs> Fear of the unknown. If you do it to yourself, it's not unknown anymore. We've got this <laughs> We're okay. Sometimes even our grandest ideas can lead to our ultimate undoing. Such was the case for inventor Dean Kamen in 2001. Prior to that year, Kamen had found plenty of success. His companies marketed and manufactured the first drug infusion pump, and he held multiple patents for technology used in portable dialysis machines. But alas, this is not what Dean Kamen is mostly known for today. We remember him for what he unveiled to great fanfare on Good Morning America on December 3rd, 2001. Before it was announced to the world, hype was through the roof for this mysterious device. Famed American venture capitalist John Durer speculated that it could be more important than the internet. And Apple Steve Jobs was quoted as saying it was, quote, as big a deal as the PC, end quote. And what was this surely world-shattering invention set to change Earth forever? It was the Segway, the two-wheeled self-balancing scooter that took the world by, well... 
what exactly is the opposite of a storm? As the hype quickly died down, the disappointment was palpable. The high price of $5,000 kept it out of most people's reach. And as an early Segway employee was quoted as saying, the Segway had a certain, quote, dork factor <laughs> that the product never overcame. Steve Jobs later recanted his original praise, saying the Segway's design, quote, pretty much sucked, end quote. I, Tom Metz III, have personally ridden one when visiting my late grandparents' gated community in Jacksonville, Florida. And everyone I scooted by looked at me like I was a real, quote, dick, end quote. Ultimately, Segway only shipped 140,000 units before finally shutting down for good recently in 2020. As a side note, Dean Kamen wasn't the only one brought low by the expensive scooter. Millionaire James Hesselden purchased the Segway company on Christmas in 2009, saying he felt the grand design of the Segway held tremendous potential. Nine months later, though, Hesselden tragically passed away on his West Yorkshire property when he accidentally fell off a cliff while driving, say it with me, a Segway. Want to see how long before Pete and I's creation destroys us? Want to listen in real time as we inevitably drive this podcast off a proverbial cliff? Then why not sign up, join us on this anxiety train, and become a panic bow today? Go to whatsthatsmell.net and for a low, low price of $35, what in money? Yes, that's it. You can help support this season, season seven of What's That Smell. And you get more. You get special member bonus time podcast listen words and you also get stickers and most importantly you will help us continue to make this podcast we love making this podcast but it is not free to do so so help us support this anxiety train and we really appreciate it go to what's that smell.net and become a panic pal today and now on with the show tom ah! <laughs> i thought you were an alien <laughs> Uh, did you, have you, what's your story on, like, you, you got your undergraduate degree when you, when you graduated from undergrad, what was your final project? Do you My remember thesis? for your major? Yeah. Your thesis. What was that? Yeah. It was, um, comparing and contrasting differing versions of hell in literature and film. So how, how the devil and hell, like the bad place, um, were compared and described in things like in Shakespeare, the Bible, Faust, and then movies like Hellraiser and a Hercules movie and other things like that. Because at the time, there ha wasn't really, no one was really comparing and contrasting hell, so yeah. I thought that'd be interesting. And then uh, we did my study, and then two weeks later, someone... <laughs> I released a book, which I could see from where I'm sitting, called The History of Hell. <laughs> and they did exactly that, except not with um, movies. So Things I was there first. We're going great. Yeah, you did great. Yeah. That was all you. Do you when you did this study, mm -hmm. what was it like to actually, like, did you have to present it or did you just turn it in? No, I had to turn it in, but then defend it in front of like a group. There of you go. That's my, what I want to talk about faculty advisor and then four uh -huh. other people that made up the honors commission and i had to defend it for like an hour or something oh so and good it very famously it went well and then uh -huh. ended terribly can i tell you real quick can I'm i tell you a really quick story that. yes absolutely so at the, at the very end i mistook a sum up i mistook a question for a sum up because they said, we were a little disappointed that you didn't use, compare uh, William Blake's writing to Clive Barker's in Hellraiser because of the blah, 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 blah. And then they stopped talking and they looked at me and I said, mm. I didn't realize till later they were giving me a chance to do that. <laughs> we stood and stared at each other and then they went, yes. well, OK. And I saw the moment. <laughs> Just flit away like tears in rain. And I was like, wait, that was a chance for me that to was... do it. I thought they were like wrapping up and just saying, Could you here's be what more you missed. Specific pal. Next time. <laughs> oh, and I just, and they were like, okay, I guess he's done talking. Like I turned off like a robot. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I still got cum laude. Ooh, well, you're a real smarty. You deserve every bit of that. Thank you. you. Really Thank do. You. you really do. Oh. Well, that that actually. So I, you know, if, if any, if you're in academics for any length of time, eventually, if you're pursuing, you know, uh, uh, your undergraduate degree, your graduate degree, postgraduate degree, you're gonna have to do what Tom just described, which is you're gonna have to 
to uh, take a stab at defending your understanding of your principal research. In Tom's right. case, it was hell because that's Weird. where he lives every day. <laughs> and uh, in other cases, you know, I, for me, it was business. It was, uh, you know, for my graduate degree. But uh, then, um, uh, you know, in some cases, it's a little bit different. Like my undergrad was in was in journalism. I had to actually do a, a documentary news piece. And so oh, wow. my defense was to do the work and turn it in. And then I didn't even have to defend anything for my undergrad. I just awesome. I actually didn't even show up. I presented it. What? They showed it. I was too anxious. I couldn't go. And he, my professor actually sent me a note and said, hey, you did great. I don't know why you didn't come watch us love oh, this piece. Like it was nice it was amazing and sad. So that's where I come from. But then, you know, graduate degree, you stand up and you you have to defend it in front of a panel of other mm -hmm. academics and, and educators. And this that sort of sets the table for today's listener submission. Oh, I didn't know we had a listener submission this week. Outstanding. We, we have a listener right. submission this week. I, it's a little bit long, but I'd like to read it to you because I think it it hits where uh, both of us possibly live. Oh, no. Hey, academic guys. Worries? Oh, ooh, mm -hmm. good start. Go ahead. I am about to defend my doctoral thesis. Been working on this research for years. I've been teaching in university for seven years, and I've helped a number of my peers prepare for their thesis defense. I'm back from a year of research, and I have finished my principal draft of my thesis, and I've got my committee sorted. Given my experience, you would think that I would be in good shape for my defense. But starting mm -hmm. about a month ago, I've started having the same dream in which I walk into the committee defense chamber and it's Ooh. all wrought of stone and iron. No, my no. committee, my committee of three is seated behind it and they tell me that my defense will be a trial by blood. They're, they are confident that I understand the nature of my research. And so now it is time for me to defend my life. I don't oh. know how it ends. I feel like I get hit a few times by the night and pass out, <laughs> which invariably makes me wake up. I've never suffered anxiety dreams in my life, and now I have one I cannot shake. Ideas? Signed, Dr. Doomed. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that is the best first, please, the best wow. interpretation of a doctoral thesis defense I have ever heard. I am sure that Absolutely. you are not alone, Doc, yeah. because... I looked up and you're definitely not alone, but this one is so viscerally satisfying. This is like, Dude. uh, what was the fight against the serpent against the, was it the, it wasn't the hound. It was the mountain in game of Thrones. But oh, right. Like that is what I picture except You'll for, in, yeah, <laughs> he squeezes his head. Like yep. that is, it is so horrifying and actually probably on some level should be what a thesis defense is. Like you've done all the research. Now just go play darts or something like really. Oh, you want to have a slightly gladiator. Yeah, it experience. should be more gladiatorial or joustatorial <laughs> or something like that. Don't you think like it just feels like it would really spice it up because it yeah. needs to like put on a tie and go talk about stuff. Just go. Right. Just go fight it out. <laughs> oh, yeah. That is, but but I totally get it. And so I feel like this, we got to tackle this in two ways. Yeah. The first is we need, we're just going to get it out of the way, which is the academic side, because you're a professional academic. You've been teaching in universities, Dr. Doom. I assume after your master's thesis, you, uh, after your master's uh, on your way to your doctoral thesis, you've been teaching this whole time. Like, you know what it's like to, to be an academic. That That's out. So just ask yourself the big, the big five questions, right? Like, have you done your research? <laughs> yes, you have done your research. Is it original research? Presumably, yes. Is there any evidence of plagiarism? They really care about that, as it turns out. Uh, and uh, have have you? Do you have your own thesis advisor, right? Have you? Can have you? Like, even though you have helped in the defense of others' theses, do you have your own coach? Like, that's mm -hmm. really, really important, as it turns out. And and have you practiced by doing, like, a mock thesis defense? That's really, those are the big five. Like, if you've done the academic work, preparing mm. is really practicing. Uh, did you practice when you did yours? I came up with, like, a list of 10 or so questions that I thought yeah. they might and just sort of came up with some pithy answers to it yeah. and then decided which question I was just going to completely shut down on apparently <laughs> <laughs> they say William Blake and that's my safe word and I just <laughs> yeah just that's down. right you just turn into an avocado because you bring up the fact that Dr. Doomed is a teacher and has been teaching so long do you think part of it has to do with the fact that the tables are turning I do that she As or he happens. is now on the other side of the table yeah. because doing it for your life doing it for you know Another way of saying that is doing it sort of for your legacy. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he has been saying, 
he or she, my apologies, doctor, the good doctor, we'll just say the good doctor. The good doctor. Um, the good doctor um, has been saying, in a way, I am smart enough to be able to teach this to other people. And now the good doctor is being judged. Yes. And that could get into imposter syndrome. That could get into a whole bunch of things that feel as severe as trial by combat. Because you're yes. com you're fighting for your legacy. You're fighting for what your life represents. Which right. is... Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. It's huge. And this is this is what I mean, that you're it's like you're reading ahead. I love it because that's <gasps> exactly what it is. You uh, uh, good doctor. You have to to know that you have so many reasons to be thrilled. Right. Practically. And when you're awake, your thesis is finished. Right. You're going through revision and defense prep. The biggest hurdle most people face in this process is ABD. Right. That exists for a reason. All but dissertation. Like they've done all of the coursework oh. and even a lot of the research and they haven't finished because they haven't been able to finish their thesis or their dissertation they right. haven't been able to do the defense and that's that is a horrible place to be if if that is what you know if you're going to be a professional academic you you've done all the work so there's great reason to be excited but just like tom just said the 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 process of turning that table of now having to defend something which feels like your day-to-day -day is already accounting for uh. is enough to trigger anxiety dreams, repetitive, right. compulsive anxiety dreams. Uh, according to analyst Claudia Louise, uh, she says that anxiety dreams are generated as a result of unprocessed negative stimuli. The brain is trying to process through the regulatory process of sleep, right? So I look at this okay. as like the way of taking your worldview and shaking it up to make to help you understand it better when you wake up. Right. It's oh. your unconscious mind's way of educating you on your own thoughts. And huh. if you can stop and take a step back and think to yourself, OK, what is this like the, the fear of the defense is, you know, what what is it that, about the fear of the defense that's really driving me? Because right. my hunch is, like you say, it's not the fear that you haven't done the research and that you don't know the material. Right. It's right. not the fear that your credibility is going to be impugned as a as a plagiarist or something. It's not any of the practical academic fears because you have those unlock. Right. You have great experience doing that stuff. It's likely that you have a bunch of people who have been watching you and taking your classes and they're going to turn around and they're going to be watching whether or not you succeed in your defense. Hmm. And that even though that's a story that you're likely painting, and it's certainly one that I have painted in the past, like, <laughs> yeah. I feel like that is something that could really shake your worldview and, and sure. cause and, and spur some of these perseverative dream cycles. What do you think? I do agree. And I think there's also, uh, in addition to all of that, which I do feel fairly strongly about, that that's one of the reasons that mm -hmm. the good doctor is going through this. But also... The doctor, if I remember correctly, the way that they wrote about it was walk in to see that they are in a gladiator thing. They are surprised by it. And so there's yeah. also a healthy fear of the unknown that right. they have potentially done so much work, so much that they are in control of. Mm -hmm. And then when it's finally time for that final finish line, they are giving up control to right. a certain extent because other people, they don't know the questions that are going to be asked. Right. And one way that your mind can maybe synthesize that is, oh, no, it's a punch fight. <laughs> They're <laughs> yeah, going to exactly. hit you with a great big punch and then well, good luck. Here's an interesting side story. So I was talking to our dear friend, Dr. Dodge, Dr. Dodge, uh -huh. friend of the show, who uh, I told him that we were going in to talk about this. And he said, you want to hear a oh. horrible story. So this isn't going to help you, Dr. Doomed. I'm sorry that I'm about to do this. But oh. uh, Dodge told me of the story of his dad's thesis defense. So his dad was doing some research on, this was for his PhD, and he was doing some research on, I, I don't actually even know the subject, but it took him to Botswana for a year where he mm. was studying poverty and something like that. And he took his family, his wife and his young child, and they went to Botswana for a year to do this research. He finished his thesis. He came back. And what you need to know if you're not familiar with the process is, like, generally, you have some influence over who your thesis committee is, right? right. You're, you have your thesis advisor, and then you can go through and select, like, the, I would like these people on my panel. And assuming mm -hmm. everybody agrees and they agree to participate, you end up having a panel. And there were three people on this panel and his advisor. And of those four people, two people on the panel in the intervening year in which he was in Botswana retired 
And oh. they were automatically replaced by two more people who came to him in his first post-research meeting and said, we don't like your topic. We think you should start again. <laughs> okay, so this is, a, this is an anom anomalous. The yes. odds of this happening are incredibly little. Yes, but that's incredibly insane. Little. <laughs> but it's insane. It is yes. insane. And so uh, that, like, those kinds of things can happen, but probably won't. Probably right. won't. It, right. Horrible, but probably you're going to be fine. So just take solace in the fact that you have some control. You probably know the people and you've helped others prepare for their defenses. Like count on that right. experience and and keep talking to yourself. Now that is, that keep talking to yourself. That's not great advice, <laughs> but probably will work fine. Um, uh, one of the things that that I think was so interesting that, that uh, this Dr. Louise said that I thought was really great is make sure if you want to work through your dreams, especially dreams you're having over and over again, Write them out. This isn't necessarily dream oh, journaling, but you right. had the dream so many times. Huh. You know the dream. Clearly, you know the dream well enough to submit it to our dumb podcast that <laughs> you should sit down with a blank piece of paper and write the dream out and then rewrite it as a positive story. That's right. That is that. A, a strategy that you can use to help to reframe the images in your mind. And once you write it and read it, like those signals can help you uh, turn the fear and the negativity in your dream into something hopefully a little bit more positive. I think that makes a ton of sense. And I would also like to remind the good doctor, um, you are well armed. You are ready for combat. Your armor and your weapons are all of the hard work that you've already done. Right. Again, the ABD, you've done everything. You've made your chain mail and sharpened your sword. You're ready for this. Yeah. But I would also suggest um, when it's time for your dissertation, bring a shotgun. <laughs> <Is that? laughs> you can yeah, keep I, it I, in your suitcase. That's fine. Did, oh, did I not it. mention that that Dr. Doom said his thesis was actually on a uh, medieval battle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, I wonder. I wonder why those are happening. Those yeah. things are happening. Anyway. In addition to A B D, it's A B S. Always bring <laughs> shotgun. <laughs> Always bring shotgun. You never yeah. know who's on your defense committee, really. That's the truth. So, yeah. Dr. Doom, thank you so much. One thank for you. that thank this you. Thank delightful you. image of trial by combat. I'm so sorry that that is an anxiety fear that you are living with, but uh it, Hopefully this it helps. sounds like you're going to be fine and uh, yeah. start writing about it because that's what Dr. Louise says to do is write it out, and we like Dr. Louise. Never met her. Never will. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us for this episode. This week's tune is Buss It by Yarin Premack. Coming up next week... Can I just give you a couple more? Yes. We'll cut this a little short, because I think you're... <laughs> Getting <laughs> legitimately angry at me. <laughs> Let me just tell you this. Let me just tell you this. Yeah. Go to a pet yeah. store. You know what you're not going to see? What? A Persian cat. Because they're already ah, all Ah, Persian cats. Yeah. Oh, my God. They're inside metal, every metal briefcase. Smoking a cigar. <laughs> smoking a cigar. <laughs> That's what's in the metal briefcases. <laughs> oh, they got to cut <laughs> some air holes in that. <laughs> Jeez <laughs> Louise. <laughs> so that we can all go back to wearing what we want by choice. Yes, exactly. That's the goal. Yep. Goodbye, underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, underwear. Hello, work week. <laughs> <laughs> Until then, I'm Tommy Metz III. And I'm Pete Wright. Thank you for downloading. We'll be back next week on What's That Smell? <laughs> <laughs>